This is the Everything 80s Halloween Special. Les sorciers sortent le soir, les fantômes aussi. Le ciel est tout noir, les nuages sont gris. Est-ce que tu as peur des méchants esprits? Oh! Hey guys, what's happening? And welcome to the Everything 80s Halloween special. I'm Jamie, and I have to immediately explain that song, unless you're Canadian and you know exactly what that was. If you're not, this is a song called C'est l'Halloween, which was written in 1981 by Matt Maxwell. And it was a way, in Canada, we have to start taking French at around the fourth grade, so whatever, 10 years old. And one of the ways to kind of... I don't know, you know, make it more fun and take in the Halloween season was this song that was written by a former school teacher who became a performer. So basically, whenever that song came on or that song was introduced back in the class, all the kids would go bananas for this thing. I, I don't know what it was, but it's as much a part of Halloween as anything else you can think of, especially in the 80s growing up. So I just had to explain all that. So in this Halloween special, what we're going to do is because it's 80s centered, we're going to look at five kind of forgotten 80s TV Halloween specials that you probably sort of remember or hadn't heard of or didn't know the whole backstory on. And then one classic main kind of 80s Halloween special. You can probably guess what it is, but we'll get all into that in a minute. So before we start, if you haven't, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. Okay, let's do it. So Halloween's this kind of weird time of year because it's not obviously a holiday, but you know, honestly, after Christmas, it is kind of like the second biggest time of year for yearly events and specials and movies and music and things that you only get to, you know, bring out every 12 months and it's Halloween itself has lent itself, uh, you know, probably better to movies related to Halloween and the the TV specials are sort of few and far between, especially through the eighties. And that's what I want to look at is kind of some of these forgotten ones. And we got five. The first one, not totally forgotten, but is Garfield's Halloween adventure. And this is one of the standout 1980s Halloween specials as Garfield and Friends was actually a really big hit on TV. It had really high ratings and lasted a lot longer than people were expecting. I think it's because the comic strip is one of the most famous of all time, and it translates very well over into cartoon form. And everyone's already familiar with John and Odie and Nermal and all that sort of thing. So when it came time for the Halloween special, it would come out in kind of late, October 30th, 1985, just under the wire. In the following years, it would play a little earlier before Halloween, but it's actually a pretty good special as it combines a ghost and pirate story into a pretty good half hour. So if you don't remember, or it's been a while, or you've never seen it, the plot revolves around Garfield getting excited about trick-or-treating after watching the very Pennywise-inspired Binky the Clown, if you remember that, from both the cartoon and the comic. Garfield and Odie decide to dress as pirates, but while they're out, they find out that some of the costume characters are not children, but actually supernatural beings. They end up in a rowboat trying to cross a river, and they end up at the dock of an old abandoned mansion. They run into that expected, you know, creepy old man who tells the story of buried treasure, that's hidden somewhere in the house. The problem is the pirates who buried the treasure would return a hundred years later, which was this year. So these pirates of the Caribbean ghost return Garfield and Odie hide, and then they make a break for it, ending up with all their original candy and they're safe at home. And there's a lot of other stuff that goes along the way, but that was the basic premise. And this special was created by Phil Roman and then Garfield creator, Jim Davis. And their goal was to start the show as a very typical Garfield cartoon, but then let it go into more of a scarier mode. And this detour from a a cookie cutter 
cartoon special led to actually very good reviews and the creativity and the production behind it actually won this special an Emmy for outstanding animated program, which you probably wouldn't expect from a Garfield related special, but it's, I watched it again the other day and it, you know, I mean, it holds up well from its time period. And it's one of those things that kind of a low barrier to entry. Like you wouldn't even have to know anything about the characters or anything like that. So it works very well as a standalone special. The next forgotten, this one's probably really forgotten, 80s Halloween special is called The Crown of Bog. This is a this is a deep cut, but this is what happens when you combine Fraggle Rock, Game of Thrones, and Alf. And this special came out in 1981 and was created by Alf creator Paul Fusco. And I did a whole special on or podcast all about Alf. And This is, I mean, there's technically not a lot of Halloween to the special, but it came out of that time and was pitched as being Halloween special to the networks. The plot is based around, this is a whole puppet based production. Like I said, sort of that fraggle rock aspect. And the plot is based around the underground kingdom of Bog, where King Mildew is transferring power to his son, Milo, the brother of Mildew, who's named Vattel is trying to stop this as he wants his son Vandred to take the throne. There's some wise men and they decide that whoever can retrieve the crown of Bog from the outer world shall inherit the throne. The special then follows Mildew and Milo on their quest while Vadel and his son try to thwart their attempts. So the Halloween connection comes when they reach to the outer world, kind of like Uncle Traveling Matt would do in the Fraggles, which is our world. And they find themselves in a museum that's having a Halloween party. They find out that the crown can only be touched on Halloween or else you will turn to stone. So Vandal and Vandred end up getting turned to stone and Mildew and Milo return to Bog victorious. It's very, if you've never heard of this thing, it is very hard to describe this special, but you can actually check it out on YouTube. If you just search for the crown of Bog, there's the full length release of it. I think there's a few different um, channels that have it. It is it is definitely low budget, but does have it does have some creativity to it. So, like I said, this special aired on Showtime in 1981, then would occasionally be shown in the following years, but it just it didn't generate a real audience. The funny thing is to hear uh, pretty much a very close Alf impression voiced in Milo and Vandred, who was both voiced by Fusco, who did the voice of Alf on the show. The show also features Bob Fapiano uh, voicing various puppets. He would also work on Elf. Actually, majority of the staff that worked on this thing ended up working on Elf. And if you know your Elf history, Fapiano was the name of a holiday on Melmac. And as strange as this show is, there's actually even singing in it. It was what helped allow Fusco to eventually pitch a show in Elf that would be one of the biggest of the decade. So... The, the crown of bog is no dark crystal, but it's definitely amusing. Okay, the third forgotten, and this might, I don't know, this might trigger some people, but the third forgotten Halloween special is Mr. Boogity. And I distinctly remember Mr. Boogity as it aired in 1986 on Disney Sunday Movie. Do you remember that when that was a thing and Disney owned Sunday nights? I mean, they, they own everything now, but this was, uh, that was like kind of, sort of must see TV at the time on Sundays. This Halloween special is like the burbs and the money pit meet the Adams family. That's the only way I can describe it. The thing I remember as most others did is that Disney loves to scare the crap out of kids. I was around nine, I think at the time, sort of in prime Halloween mode and would also trust that whatever Disney put out was in our best interest Mr. Boogity would be one of the things that would break that trust for a lot of kids. This was a TV movie, and it was also an attempt at using it as a pilot for a future TV series, which didn't pan out. Mr. Boogity told the story of a family that moves into a new house in a New England town. The house, of course, turns out um, to be pretty much the house from the Amityville Horror or Poltergeist. The family thinks these are just pranks, because the dad loves to do pranks on their own kids, so on his own kids, so they basically brush it off. They start 
to realize there's a supernatural presence in the house and they learn in town about the history of where they live. They learn of the ghost of William Hanover, who after striking a deal with the devil, eventually would become Mr. Boogity. The family finds out that to get rid of Boogity, they have to take his magic cloak. Boogity eventually appears and is able to blast lightning out of his hands, kind of like the Emperor in Return of the Jedi. Eventually, they are able to use a vacuum to suck the cloak of Mr. Boogity, which causes him to disappear. The family feels relief that he is gone and the house is no longer haunted. But we hear the voice of Boogity exclaiming that maybe he is not gone after all, a.k.a. they were setting up a future series. And this is kind of, I mean, when they do this in a regular TV series or a sitcom, they call it a backdoor pilot where they take a, an episode and kind of introduce whatever the spinoff might be for a future series, you know, like, and it's focused on just that character, just that premise. So they did that with Mr. Boogity and a, like a full TV movie. So it's the cast features some um, actually decent actors. There's Richard Masser who played Carlton Davis Mimi Kennedy was the mom. Benji Gregory was Ari Davis. He was Brian on Alf. And he was also on shows like the A-Team, TJ Hooker. He was a voice in Pound Puppies. A young David Faustino, a.k.a. Bud Bundy from Married with Children, was in it. Christy Swanson was in it. So this movie, again, well, I'm r- roughly quoting it as a movie, is scared kids but also developed a bit of a following. And it actually would lead to a, f- a sequel called Bride of Boogity in 1987. And and some interest is still remains in this. And with Disney Plus coming out, they're releasing like their entire back catalog. And I had a look and Mr. Boogity made the cut. So more people will get to see this thing. Okay, here's another deep 1980s Halloween special cut. It's called The Midnight Hour. And this is um this is a deeper one. So, I mean... If you were waiting until Halloween to watch The Midnight Hour in 1985, you would have missed it because it aired the day after Halloween that year. The Midnight Hour was a TV movie put out by ABC in 1985 and was kind of a teenage monster movie. It told the story of a bunch of teens who break into a witchcraft museum on Halloween night. And wouldn't you know it, they accidentally raised the dead. When they have uh, also what they have raised is a witch who is hell bent on getting revenge on pretty much everyone and everything. They also, and to make it, you know, hip to the cool teens, they raise a cheerleading ghost who helps the teens, you know, fix this classic teenager mistake without them really knowing she's a ghost. The witch descends on the town and starts turning kids into vampires. The kids team up with the ghost cheerleader and have till midnight to stop this all or the town will stay cursed forever. Wouldn't you know it? They fight off the undead. They use silver bullets. They um, end up finding this ancient parchment and then are able to stop and reverse all the damage done by the undead. The main character, Phil, finally realizes that Sandy, the ghost cheerleader, was a ghost all along and she has disappeared too. But while driving home, he hears a song on the radio dedicated to him from Sandy to know she's always looking out for him. And that's a beautiful moment. So this is a legit two-hour movie that is very 80s-centered, has a lot of great 80s themes and music to go along with it. Critics didn't love it, and they called it more of a campy horror romp that was trying to be a teen comedy. But there's some like decent production. And actually, fun fact, the special effects, costume, and makeup were all done by the main guy who did the thriller video. So it, it does have that sort of aesthetic to it. The Midnight Hour still got a decent response from viewers as it fit the mold of many other 80s movies and shows. So it made it feel familiar despite having this bizarre premise. Uh, and again, you just have to ignore the fact it aired on November 1st. Again, this is you can watch this whole thing on YouTube. I watched through probably about half of it. And like I said, it's just like that standard 80s teenage movie trope, but with that Halloween spin. Like, it, it's okay, and I think it had a better response at the time. And people who liked it then will probably love it more now, just as sort of a nostalgia trip. Okay, the last one. Again, see, there wasn't a lot of 80s-specific Halloween specials. But the last one is the Pac-Man Halloween special, and it is kind of a special. It's basically two parts from previous episodes smushed together to make one Halloween show. And it 
does lend itself well to Halloween being kind of a ghost based cartoon and worked well with kids. So the first part of the special is called Pacula and it involves Pac-Man turning the tables on the ghost during a rainy night in Pac-Land. So th- during that night, he Pac-Man disguises himself as a tombstone and chases the ghosts around. Uh, he ends up chasing them into an old castle where the owner has created a Frankenstein-like Pac-Man, which is a vampire who says, I want to chomp your bones. Pac-Man then battles the Pacula monster and chases him and the ghosts around the castle as Pac-Man tends to do. Th- th- there's not a lot of deep themes in this episode, just FYI. The second part of the Pac-Man Halloween special is called Trick or Chomp. In this part, Baby Pac is excited to go trick-or-treating for the first time with his giant yellow dad. But instead of candy, they get power pellets. So things are going along fine until when you know it, the ghosts show up leading to some more chase scenes. The chase ends up in a haunted mansion, not the Garfield one. And then just to switch things up, the ghosts get chased around the mansion. They kind of painted themselves into a corner doing a Pac-Man based cartoon and they didn't expand the possibilities like they would with uh, Rubik the Amazing Cube, for example. So this Halloween special aired on October 16th, 1982. And even though it's nothing remarkable, they at least gave you some time to watch it. And it was, I think, shown a couple times and kids, kids were big on Pac-Man, so it worked out well. So those are a few of the forgotten 80 specials that hopefully have triggered a memory. And now we're going to look at what is not an 80 special, even though it comes from the 60s, but was a big part of the 80s. And it's, of course, it's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. So I try not to cover things that aren't specifically 80s based content or created in that decade. But this is one of those things that has an audience over different generations, specifically as well in the 80s. It's kind of like um, the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Christmas special or even the Charlie Brown Christmas special. That's as big a part for a kid in the 80s, even though it was made decades before. So it's worth looking at. So it's The Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown aired in 1966 on primetime in CBS, obviously based on the Peanuts comic strip and tells the story of Linus uh, and his search for the Great Pumpkin. So this special is 14 years old older than the start of the 1980s but it still remains even to this day the definitive halloween tv special so assuming you've seen this or if it's been a while a quick refresher is it starts out with lucy and linus at the local pumpkin patch trying to find the biggest one that they can the rest of the peanuts gang is also preparing for halloween while we get the classic you know lucy screwing over charlie brown trying to kick a football gag this is actually the first time we would see this gag in an animated special. And there is a lot of specials. I'll get to that in a second that I didn't realize they put out over the years. Linus is a believer in the great pumpkin, which acts like a Santa Claus sort of figure delivering presents on Halloween night. He is mocked by everyone for his belief, but he doesn't give up and continues to write letters to it or him or whatever it is. Little Sally is the only one who believes in Linus and agrees to skip trick or treating to wait in a pumpkin patch all night with him. We see the other characters going out for candy, except for Charlie Brown, who only has a bag full of rocks. I don't know how the hell Charlie Brown put up with all these D-bags he shared a world and neighborhood with. There is a party at Violet's house, and we see Snoopy in a World War I flying ace costume, flying atop his doghouse, battling the Red Baron. He then heads to the party and ends up kissing Lucy while bobbing for apples. She freaks out with a callback similar to her reaction in A Charlie Brown Christmas. So Linus is still in the pumpkin patch without a pumpkin spice latte, and he thinks he sees the great pumpkin, which turns out to be Snoopy. He passes out, and when he comes to, he doesn't give up staying out there and stays out all the way till 4 a.m. Lucy has had enough and takes her brother home. Linus and Charlie Brown commiserate about the events of the evening, with Linus vowing that the great pumpkin will definitely come next year. So looking at how this whole thing was put together, the special was created by Lee Mendelson, and it all came about when TV sponsors had seen a documentary about Charles Schultz. They wondered if this comic strip could be animated, which may lend itself to some good advertising possibilities. This is this is like the origin of the Peanuts TV specials. So this led Mendelssohn and Schultz to make A Charlie Brown Christmas, which when it aired half of the entire viewing country watched this thing. That's how 
massive it was, as well as how specifically directed any TV show in those de- in those decades, like the 50s, the 60s, going into the early 70s, and how they could absolutely capture um, the audience and the majority of all viewers on TV. So the idea for It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, was to be based on the idea of Santa, and it was adopted from a few specific comic strips that they um, Schultz had written. The basis was that there was a lot of hope and disappointment surrounding the idea of Santa Claus, and they wanted to reflect this with the great pumpkin and kind of the absurdity of how families and kids still use the tradition of Santa and how it's still a massive part of the culture and this idea of this weird kind of lie and tricking kids and believing and then one day just like, no, oh, no, it's it's not Real. So they are just the absurdity of it. They wanted to reflect in the idea of the great pumpkin. Like it makes just as much sense to believe in the great pumpkin. The special first aired on October 27th, 1966. Again, just under the wire before Halloween. It was actually the third peanut special following up from a Charlie Brown Christmas and Charlie Brown's all stars, which I don't know if as many people remember, but like, as I mentioned, there's a peanut special for pretty much every holiday event or occasion you can think of. Here's just a few. They there's um you're in love Charlie Brown for Valentine's Day. There is a summer based special called it was a short summer Charlie Brown. There's an election day one called You're Not Elected Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. It's the Easter Beagle Charlie Brown. Another Valentine's one called Be My Valentine Charlie Brown. Happy New Year Charlie Brown. Even It's Arbor Day Charlie Brown. This is just scratching the surface. I had <laughs> There are so many peanut specials over the years. Just in the 80s, there were 14 different ones. And I must have missed a lot of them because I do not remember anything. But this shows what an impact the Christmas and Halloween special really were because we continue to watch them year after year, even though they came out in 1966. So CBS would run this every year until the year 2000 when ABC picked up the rights and has continued to show it annually since 2001. Some years, this year, 2019, they're airing it twice. And, you know, usually they try to get like a mid-October and then one closer to Halloween. So looking at the success of this special, these Charlie Brown specials, they give a feeling of comfort for most people because it appeals to those who not only first watched it when it first aired in 1966, but also to new audiences today. It's amazing the legacy the Peanuts have had, and they still are finding brand new audiences every year. You know, there's like that CGI animated movie. I I don't know if they have like a Netflix one as well, but it's still remained, I don't know, this sort of iconic and embracing um, property that like the Peanuts mean nothing to kids today. Um, they're, they're not familiar with the history, but they know this like whole new special and that'll happen 10 years from now. They'll just keep reintroducing it. So the thing with that, you know, specifically, it's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, having these type of specials also like Rudolph, also like Frosty, when you have them consistently air year after year, it's like having that old friend, you know, you can always count on to stop by. And it's the great pumpkin is still a rating success. In 2008, it managed to pull in 6.28 million viewers, even though it aired early in October. When it aired the first time in 2019, it was a worldwide trending topic on Twitter. So this special is unique as it brings in a very wide demographic of people. So it's not just the baby boomers that are looking back on it with nostalgia, but over 2 million of those viewers were the prize demographic of the 18 to 49 range. And I think this is because a large majority of them, like us or, you know, depending on your age, we grew up watching it in the 80s. And to us, it was just a straight up 80s special. And probably a lot of kids weren't familiar. It was years and years older. So it's as much as like a special to us in the 80s as it was to the people watched in 1966. So the same thing, we want to relive it year after year. And again, 6 million viewers might not sound like a lot, but in this day and age, it is a ton. It still regularly beats other top competitors in its time slot, even though people have seen this special dozens of times. I think 
was it this year or last year, whatever, when it came out, it beat like the, I think shows like it's either master chef or top chef or whatever the top couple that are usually in that time slot. And this special that people have seen dozens of times still beat it, which again speaks to its legacy and it's uh kind of that, again, that comfort and that return during this time of year that is kind of always there consistently. So looking at, here's uh, the the soundtrack, which I think is worth pointing out because it's got more of that iconic music con- conducted by Vince Guaraldi. And his jazz-based score, again, has become part of Christmas tradition as he uses this sort of, you know, cool, beboppy, joyous, unique music kind of all put together. And they really, that, that music really lifted these specials as well. It's hard to tell if they would have been, I think they still would have been as prominent and effective uh, in getting an audience. But I think the music kind of lend itself to, I don't know, just to, like another level. Um, the, it's interesting with um, Giraldi and his music. And that comes back to the original documentary that featured Charles Schultz way back so we were talking about that guy Mendelssohn who helped put it together. He was dry with like all the like the Christmas special and all the future specials. Mendelssohn was driving over the Golden Gate Golden Gate Bridge and he heard Cast Your Fate to the Wind on the radio and that was performed by Giraldi. Mendelssohn thought this style would work well for the documentary and he tracked down um, the artist. The documentary was not a big hit, but Coca-Cola liked what they had seen from Mendelssohn along with the music and that led them to create the Christmas special. So with the, uh, it's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, it features 16 tracks. You can still buy it, um, on vinyl on Amazon and obviously CD and you can stream and everything like that. There's a interesting thing that the, it was reported in the Washington post about how, uh, Giraldi when recording the soundtrack took a break for a shower. When he came out, he heard some noises outside. So he went out to investigate naked as you do and accidentally locked himself out. He then <laughs> tried to climb a ladder to a second floor window, still naked. When the cop showed up, he apparently said, don't shoot. I'm the great pumpkin, but the special had not been aired yet. So that reference pretty much meant nothing. And the cops thought he was psychotic. It all worked out, I think. So here's um, a few more fun facts related to It's a Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Kathy Steinberg, who did the voice of Sally, had to be rushed to get her lines done as she was about to lose a tooth, and the list would have severely affected her recordings. The fact that Charlie Brown received rocks actually angered viewers and fellow kids and they would end up sending candy to Schultz's office for years addressed to Charlie Brown. I don't know if people were thinking this is a real person or just the idea that they're contributing somehow, but a lot for years people were sending candy to his office. Another fact, the girl who recorded the voice of Lucy would get so nervous to do her lines that she would throw up after every single take, which is the exact same thing that happens to me recording these podcasts. And then I think the most interesting fact is the network had, you know, they had the the Peanuts Christmas special, but they wanted another one that they could play every year. The idea was that if Mendelssohn wasn't able to put together a Halloween special and make it a hit, CBS was not going to produce any more Peanuts specials, which is a real jerk move and a lot of pressure at the same time to put these things to get, together. They, as, holding like a figure of gun to their head, but it obviously worked out. So I'll start wrapping up here. Uh, When I was young, I went to school with a kid who believed in the great pumpkin. And I don't think he actually believed in him, but he was such a fan of the special and the peanuts in general that he kind of made this whole thing part of his identity. And, you know, random beliefs aside, again, that shows how impactful it's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown was during the 1980s. Even though it was made a long time before, it's been adopted by people of you know that 80s based age who grew up watching it. So and it it falls into that category again with you know Rudolph Frosty Charlie Brown Christmas. It's adored by multiple generations who embraced it as their own. So that concludes the everything 80s Halloween special and looked at a nice sampling of sort of familiar 80s Halloween specials, completely forgotten ones, and then, you know, the probably the most iconic 
of all time. So thanks for taking the time to listen to this show. I appreciate it. I know there's a lot of shows out there. So the fact you listen to this one means a lot. I will be back soon with non-Halloween related 80s based shows. But to finish off, we'll have Matt Maxwell take us out with Say Halloween. Les fantômes aussi Le ciel est tout noir Les nuages sont gris Est-ce que tu as peur Des méchants esprits Oh, monsieur Oui, 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 oui. C'est Halloween C'est Ce que tu veux, le tigre féroce ou un serpent bleu. Il se fait tard quand tu es à la maison. Say